What's up everybody, Pastor Matt here. Thanks for checking into my YouTube channel. It is time to seek the Greek. That's right, next year, 2021, starting in January, I'm gonna be reading all the way through the Greek New Testament, a task that I have never done before. I've translated books of the Bible individually, Mark and things like that before, but I'm gonna to try to read the whole Greek New Testament. And so to do that, I'm going to find for myself the ultimate Greek New Testament through which to read. So if you are new to this YouTube channel, my name is Matt. I'm the pastor of Gospel Fellowship PCA. We're a Reformed Church just north of Pittsburgh. If you're looking for a church that believes the Bible is true, is on a mission to share the good news of the gospel with the world, uh, and you're anywhere north of Pittsburgh, come visit us, Gospel Fellowship PCA. All right, so a little bit of background before we re review our first Greek New Testament, which in this case is going to be the 28th edition of the Nestle Alans Critical Greek New Testament. We'll get to that in just a moment. But let me first tell you my experience with Greek. Um, I loved Greek as a Bible major at Malone College, now called Malone University. In fact, Greek was probably my favorite class. I had an excellent Greek New Testament professor, Dr. Watson, who recently retired, and he bequeathed to us Bible students an absolute love for the biblical languages. The moment I saw the Greek letters and began to learn my first few Greek words, I knew I was in love. And Greek has always had a special place in my heart because I feel so close to the very Word of God when I read it. So uh, not to brag, but I did pretty well in that class. And uh, my professor even gave me an award at the end of the year, which only encouraged me all the more to seek it. Took Greek again when I was in my master's program at Ashland Theological Seminary. And so uh, since then, however, my usage of Greek has been mostly pastoral, looking up things in the New Testament as I preach through books of the Bible, using the Greek to aid my sermons and whatnot. But now, here I am. I've been out of school for quite some time. I graduated from Malone in uh, 1999 in Ashland in 2006, and then RTS with my doctorate 2016. So it's been four years now since I've been in an academic setting, and it's just time to get back to the Greek. So when I start to do that in January of 2021, reading through the whole Greek New Testament, I thought to myself, well, it's probably time for me to get a new Greek New Testament. That'll motivate me and I'll be excited to just read through it. So what I did is I ordered several Greek New Testaments, which I'm going to be reviewing in the next few videos. And so we're going to do the new Tyndale House Greek New Testament by Crossway and Cambridge. We're going to do the UBS 5, which is related to the NA28, if you know anything about that. And um, we'll, we'll see what else we review. But we're going to start off with one of the most important of the Greek New Testaments, and that is the Nestle Aland 28th edition of the Critical Text. This is an eclectic text that uses all kinds of manuscript background research and evidence, 5,500 some Greek New Testament manuscripts there are, which is an abundance of riches. Now, in this video, I'm not going to get into the whole textus receptus versus critical text debate. And that is something that I've given quite a bit of thought of um, in recent months. And maybe I will do a separate video on the differences between those two Greek texts and where I land and why I landed, where I ended up landed. But that's not the purpose of this video. In this video right here, we're going to look at probably one of the most important Greek New Testaments that you can buy today, and that is the 28th edition of the Nestle Aland Critical Text. So with that, I'm going to hit pause for a moment, switch my camera around, and we're going to get into reviewing this Bible. Now, I, I do need to say this, and this is only fair to let you know that Hendrickson Publications sent this book to me for free to review as long as I give it an honest review. And I also need to declare that because I'm working with Hendrickson to publish a book on Jonathan Edwards next year, that uh, I'm gonna have to be really try hard to be objective. And I think I'm gonna be able to carry that out fairly easily. I'll give you the strengths and the weaknesses of the Nestle Aland 28th edition. And then I will post a, a, a link to Amazon where you can go buy that straight from Amazon in the description of this video. So there will be a link in the description if you're interested in this 28th edition. So let me hit pause for a moment. I'll get myself reoriented, flip the camera around, and we'll get straight to work. Alrighty then, so here we are having a look at the Novum Testamentum Greca, as you can see, Nestle Aland at the top. We've got what looks like a hardback here in a blue 
genuine leather. I'm thinking that this is pigskin, dyed blue, very attractive. We've got the German Bible Society logo down here. This is a hand size edition, so this is almost exactly one Matthew Everhard size hand, which would be, I don't know, in the neighborhood of uh, five and a half by seven and a half. A little bit less than about an inch thick, and this is going to be a leather overboard to the best of my estimation. If you open up on the inside, what we see here is we have the maps that are relevant to our New Testament studies. And as we begin to open up the book itself, one of the things that you're going to notice is that there is a whole lot of German language printed here in this particular text. Let me focus my camera and make sure we're doing okay here. All right, we're working with substandard cameras and stuff. This is a very cheap video podcast here on YouTube by yours truly. Uh, but most of this, the introduction, is in German, and that's because that Hendrickson works with in cooperation with the German Bible Society. And so most of the first 50 pages or so are going to be German, and we're going to skip straight through that. And then we're going to get to the exact same information in English. So if you want to read about the history of this particular edition, it's right here for you, for your perusal. And when we get to page 50 or so, one of the things that's kind of interesting is to look at this little chart here, which would be the differences in the text between the 27th edition of the Nestle Alond and the new 28th edition of the Nestle Alond, which we're currently looking at in this video. Uh, as soon as I say that, be reminded, of course, that the 29th edition is due, I believe, in 2022, possibly sooner, possibly later than that, but there is a scheduled 29th edition which is not available for you yet. But this little chart is going to show you all the differences then between the 28th edition and the previous edition, the 27th. And just by the fact that we're barely looking at one full page here, you can tell that most of the differences in the actual text text itself are very, very minor. In a few cases, we're talking about the spelling of a word. In uh, another couple of cases, we're talking about slight word order variation. So it's certainly not as though the Greek New Testament uh, of this critical edition has changed very much, although there are probably more changes in the apparatus below the text, which I'll explain for you in just a moment if you don't have one of these Greek Testaments before. One of the things that you're going to notice is that there is a whole lot of symbols and keys in this particular edition of the Greek New Testament because the 28th and after that the 29th and before that the 27th is the version of the Greek New Testament that is used by the very most technical scholars. So this is not the New Testament that you're going to want to jump into if you're just learning how to read Greek. Uh, this is the text that they use to translate the Bible in translations like the ESV and the NASB and the NIV and the, the NETS translation. This is the book that the most technical scholars are working with. All right, so there's going to be a ton of symbols within the actual Greek text, text itself. And some of these keys are going to tell you what this is. Uh, different things like double brackets versus single brackets and all kinds of little symbols in the text. And so all of that is explained in some of this front matter. Um, when we get to this next section about the Greek witnesses, this is where I practically melt into tears, to be completely honest. Because this is where we explain all of the abundance of the manuscripts that we have by which we translate the New Testament. So we've got little symbols and uh, little codes for all of the manuscripts themselves from the papyri to the majuscule texts. Uh, that here's the papyri symbols. Here's the majuscule text or the uniciales or the minuscules, the lectionaries. Um, the ancient witnesses of the, the earliest writers, some of the Latin versions, the Coptic versions, the Syriac versions, so many different uh, pieces of archaeological and manuscript evidence. We have Coptic versions here. We've got many of the church fathers are going to be cited in this. And so the reason this melts me uh, almost into thankful tears is because this book 
presents the culmination of hundreds of years of scholarship, begun by people like Erasmus and Beza, but carried on even through some of the best scholars of our day. And so when you see how technical this apparatus is going to be for you, you're just, your heart is just going to want to melt in thankfulness that God has preserved his word through these hundreds and indeed thousands of Greek manuscripts. Now here, when we get to the table of contents, I do want to note that the books are presented in the same canonical order that you would normally find in your New, in your New Testament. Now the only reason I point that out, that's like stating the obvious, is that that's not what the Tyndale Greek Testament does, which we're going to review in a later video. They go with a different order of the New Testament books that apparently was used in some of the older codexes of the New Testament. All right, so let's jump ahead to a page of the New Testament here and let's see what we get. In fact, I'm going to jump to the page that I read this morning in my devotions, and you're going to notice that because I've got a bunch of red highlighting here. All right, so here's here's chapter 8, and when I read the, the Greek New Testament, what I like to do is write in red any words that uh, maybe I need to refresh my vocabulary so that the next time I read it, I'll just have that as a little gloss sitting above the Greek Testament word. But let's just have a look at a very, very basic page here. You're going to notice that this is your, your Greek New Testament. Uh, we do have chapter headings up here at the top of the page. These are going to tell us what section of the Bible we're looking at. In this case, chapter 7, verse 23, through chapter 8, verse 3. And like many Bibles that you probably already have, your right column is filled with cross-references. These are places that the New Testament is either quoting or there are allusions to that or glosses to that. And so this is going to cue you into other sections of the New Testament and the Old Testament and sometimes some of the uh, even the apocryphal books if there are references to those things. Uh, so I can see here one reference to the book of Maccabees, or a similarity at least to the book of Maccabees. And so remember, this is done for a, the sake of very technical commentary work. Um, just a basic observation of this page right here. I will tell you that this font that is used of the Greek is a, is a standard font. Old Testament quotations are given in italics, which is different from the UBS 5, which we're going to review later. In the UBS 5, the main text is in italics, and then Old Testament quotes are in bold. So that's a little bit uh, unusual right there. Um, over here in the inner column, I don't know what to use, what use this may be, but apparently there's some very old lectionary readings done by Eusebius, and these cue you into uh, where that particular reading might fall in those old, old ancient lectionary readings. Not so helpful for me, but perhaps for some other New Testament scholars. Inside the text itself, you're going to see all of these little symbols, little brackets, various styles of brackets, and asterisks and other things, and each one of those is going to have a particular meaning. Uh, maybe some of the words are, di are not present in particular manuscripts, or perhaps the word order is different in very many manus several manuscripts, for instance. Um, but all of that is going to be explained in some sort of a code, which you have to get used to, down here in what's called the textual apparatus. Now, most of the New Testaments that I'm going to review in these Bible reviews are going to contain some kind of an apparatus, and they all work a little bit differently. Unfortunately, though there are similarities, uh, very often some of the symbols cue to different things. Basically, what you have in any Greek Testament apparatus is an explanation of which of the manuscripts have this variant and which of the manuscripts have that variant. So in an eclectic text like the Nestle Aland 28th edition, basically what they're doing is through the use of their scholarship, logic, and rigorous analysis, they're giving to you in the main text what they believe to be the most authentic, original, and ancient uh, writing to the best that we can possibly know it. But given to the fact that there are variations in our 5,000 plus manuscripts, that's where the apparatus comes in down here, and this explains why they chose the main reading, and then very often down here they'll include some alternate readings uh, that they didn't go with in the, in the main text above. Okay, so that's basically how the apparatus works, and you're going to have to work through the key symbols uh, in, the, in the 
the pre-factory materials and in some of the, the after afterward materials to fully understand exactly how to use the apparatus. If you've done much translation before, you can eventually get the hang of it pretty quickly. Basically, it'll show you a, a symbol of a, of a manuscript like uh, Sinaiticus or Vaticanus or Alexandrinitis or uh, the, the Bezai Codex or whatever. And it'll let you know if it's present in this one or that one, or whether it's in a, a papyri, or whether it's missing from this minuscule, or it's present in that one. That's basically how the, the apparatus works. And it's all too complicated, I think, for, for beginners, but can be very helpful to those who've been working through the Greek materials more diligently. So let's flip to an example text here, and uh, we'll come to one of the more controversial passages in the Greek New Testament, which would be the Pericope Adulterae, or the section on adultery. That's the famous section in John 7:53 through uh, 8, 1 to 10, in which Jesus encounters uh, a woman accused of adultery. Now you're going to notice here in this text that this is included in double brackets. And that means that although they placed it here in the main text above, there is some dubiousness to this text, namely that it's not present in several of the oldest manuscripts, although it is present in several others. And if you're interested in which manuscripts it's found in and which it's not found in, then all of that is going to be coded for you down here and explained in the apparatus, as well as several other variants. Now let's flip to one more that's a pretty a controversial text, and that would be the Johannian comma, which is this famous phrase from 1 John chapter 5, which you can see is not placed here in verse 7. Now in some manuscripts, if you're from the TR tradition or the King James tradition, verse 7 is a lot longer than it is here in the critical text. And that's all explained again down here in the apparatus why it's not present up here in the main text is simply because there is no Greek, no, no Greek manuscript really before exceedingly late, I think like 15th century or something like that, that has it present. And so obviously, given that it's found in very, very, very few original Greek manuscripts, I should say ancient Greek manuscripts, we don't have the originals, duh, um, they did not present it here in the main body of 1 John chapter 5. Now, one other thing is worth mentioning here in the Nestle Alond, and that is this incredibly cool section towards the end in the back. And in fact, we have to flip it this way to see what we're doing here. But in this section of this Bible, what they have here is the manuscript key or the code. So this is papyrus number one, papyrus number two, etc what century it's believed to be from, to the best of our knowledge, 3rd, 4th, 5th, 3rd, and then what library that actual manuscript can be found in. And then this is interesting too, what part of the New Testament um, is, is it contain, does it contain? So Matthew, John, Luke, whatever, Acts, where, uh, what portions of scripture actually contain that very text. Okay, so what we have here in summary in the Nestle Alon 28 is the most technical, excuse me, the most technical edition of the Greek New Testament that you could possibly want. Uh, I might say this, that the paper is decent. It's very smooth and nice to the touch, but it's a little bit thinner than uh, some others that I've seen. The font in the Greek is a little bit smaller than I'd like, and the textual apparatus is probably way more than I'm ever going to need. This is definitely a drinking from the fire hose informational situation down here in this book. Okay, But good to start with the best in the sense that this one has the most and the greatest technical information that you could possibly need as a New Testament scholar with the caveat that this is probably not going to be the most appropriate one for beginners, but is definitely going to be the one that you would need if you are a serious New Testament reader or critical scholar or theologian. All right, so I will do some more re video reviews on other uh, Greek New Testament texts following this video, but that's it for now. I will, again, post a link to this particular book in the description of this video. Thank you so much for checking in. Do love you lots, and we'll talk to you later.